Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is April 1st, 2022. And this weekend, I'm picking up the Hanging with the Sock Dem Gang series, which I have not done in several months. I think I might start doing these once a month again, as really any more frequently than that, they just become really, really aggravating. Anyway, this video is a commentary and reaction from a Marxist perspective to David Pakman's Democracy in Peril if Republicans win the House. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So I started out this weekend's Sock Dem Gang series with a Kyle Kalinske video. My usual methodology applied. Basically, I go to the Secular Talk Kyle Kalinske channel and I look at the linked channels and then I go through their recent videos and see if anything grabs me. And we did get a decent haul this weekend. Kyle Kalinske, David Packman, David Dole, Tom Hartman, Tim Black, and Joe Rogan are all potentially on the roster. We'll see what I actually get through. But uh, Packman, of course, you know, is on the love to hate list for sure. He, I think, is one of the more right wing out of the entire Sock Dem gang. In fact, he's probably more of just a garden variety, middle of the road, liberal, not even particularly left wing. So the Kyle Kalinske video had to do with AOC basically warning Joe Biden and the other Democrats, hey, if you don't do like at least a tenth of the things that you promised to do in the 2020 elections, you're going to get trounced. We are going to get trounced in 2022. But, you know, my basic response to that is the Democrats are there to run protection for capitalism and uh, the people behind their party are going to fund them whether they win or not because they fund both sides because keeping the conflict between the Democrats and the Republicans rather than, you know, having the Democrats ally with the left, enact broad popular reforms and, you know, put the Republicans out of business as easily could be done, that's not in the interests of the people, the big money that backs the Democratic and Republican parties. But we'll get into that as we got into it in the last video here, critiquing Pacman on, you know, the Democrats, same old song and dance about democracies in peril. It's the most important election of our lifetimes. Stop me if you've heard this one, you know, if the Republicans win, this and that. And I'm not saying that the Republicans aren't frighteningly right wing. They are. It's disturbing. But what are Democrats doing about it? They could send the Republicans to the dustbin of history. You know, as the saying goes, if U.S. politics were for real, one of the parties would do universal health care and the other one would never get elected again. Well, the Democrats could do that. It's been proposed to them many times. They actively refuse it with everything that they have. Well, so I guess I'm tired of the squawking then from them about this when they're the ones primarily standing in the way of doing something about the Republican Party. Locked and loaded. Let's get into Pacman. One of the things I try to avoid on this show is to be hyperbolic. And when people are going crazy about something and it's really no big deal, I try to just say this is really not that big of a deal. Let's talk about it, but let's talk about it in sort of sober and reasonable terms. But that is very much not the case when it comes to the peril that uh, is on the horizon if Republicans were to win the 2022 midterm elections in what are just a few months now, uh, quite frankly. And when I say democracy is in jeopardy, if Republicans take the House in 2022, I say it with the caveat that this is not a hyperbolic claim. And increasingly, I mean, the, the bad thing is that democracy is in peril if Republicans win. The good thing is increasingly people are understanding this peril and this risk. Uh, Republicans and Democrats who are so similar on so many issues, we've talked about it before. Here's a whole bunch of issues on which there's really no significant difference between Republicans and Democrats. How could it be that if Republicans take one chamber of, of Congress, it would have such a major impact. And the answer is that it is because of the destructive potential that the series of events that could be unleashed by Republicans taking control of the House is so significant that it could be the catalyst for a disaster for democracy. And let's just think it through. OK, before we start to 
think it through, and I will grant Pacman that we have not heard his specific pitch yet. Let's just recap what has been said so far. So basically, I would say that if you know AOC was making the positive warning to Biden, hey, do something for people, kind of like you said you would, that's why they fucking voted for you. And if you don't, that's why they won't vote for you. Pacman is playing side B, if you will, of this particular record, which is but Trump or, you know, but the Republicans, but Bush, but Romney, whatever. It's but look how bad the Republicans are. Again, I'm not saying that they're not alarmingly bad, but my real question to anyone supporting the Democrats is let's say for a minute that everything that Pacman is saying is true about the threat to democracy, this and that. I mean, the actual fact is that democracy is already long gone in the United States. It does not exist. Maybe at the local level in some places or on, you know, statewide ballot questions, things like that. But as far as the level he's talking about, Congress, that's, um, that ship has sailed. The Princeton study on democracy found, I think it was Congress was the worst. It was like 98% of the races are just won by whoever spends the most money. That's not a fucking democracy. That's called buying elections. Okay, but let's take a more general premise that if the Republicans win the House specifically, as Pacman is saying, in 2022, then something very bad will happen. As bad as things are now, they're going to get worse. And yeah, I could see that. Republicans are always trying to come up with new, really awful things to do. And we already have enough really awful things happening that need to be undone as it is. I don't, you know, want any more bad things to be happening in the United States, certainly. But when was the last time that the United States was not in this position? Okay, if we go back 20 years, we had Bush and Cheney and the outbreak of the global war on terror, which was a war of aggression by the United States for oil, for minerals, for geopolitical ends. Okay, so that's going 20 years back. 30 years back, you have Newt Gingrich, the Republican Revolution. Before that is Reagan. We've been in this position for like 40 years. So my question is, how, if you were supporting the Democrats, which I don't, it I believe is the left's fundamental task right now to break with the Democratic Party and with all capitalist political parties because they represent our class enemy, the ultra-rich, the 1%, the big bourgeoisie, the people who control the economy and run it for profit and are just cutting back every kind of public everything. Defund, privatize, deregulate. That is the battle cry of the last few decades. And the Democrats have been in on this. So let's say that you're genuinely opposed to this rightward shift that the Democrats have in fact been contributing to. Or let's say you want to do some mental gymnastics and say they just haven't been opposing it effectively. Well, I would contest that, but still, I'll I'll give you that for the sake of the argument. Why are you still supporting them when the country has been in this position for decades, which clearly they have either actively contributed to, there's ample evidence for that, or at the very minimum, they have been totally ineffective at opposing, totally ineffective at stopping all of this from coming to fruition. And now we're at the end. As Pacman is making the case, we're at the end of the line. This is it. Everything has failed. Why are you still supporting the people who oversaw that failure, who have overseen the progression to the point where there is, quote, the destructive potential of a series of events that could be a catalyst for, you know, fucking Cthulhu coming back, whatever it is. You know, the elder gods, there's a rip in the sky, they're about to walk through. All they need is the Republicans to take control of the House. Why are you still supporting the people who, in fact, this whole time could have taken them out, have utterly refused to do so, and have stood in the way of the left, have co-opted the left, have suppressed the left at every fucking turn? Why would you still support them? Why? It makes no goddamn sense whatsoever. Then again, talking to Pacman, we're talking to somebody who supported Liz Warren 
in the 2020 primary and somebody who thinks that the United States is like a beacon of human rights compared to Cuba and Venezuela. That's who we're talking about here. So I guess you can kind of see why this guy's points of view suck. I, you know, anyway, back to Pacman. First, we know that Republicans see their 2020 failure as a failure to steal the election. What I mean by that is when you hear Republicans talk about 2020, most of them, I mean, okay, Mitt Romney's the exception, Liz Cheney's the exception. But for the most part, when you hear Trump, people associated with the Trump White House, the more weaponized Republicans in the House and Senate, when they talk about what happened in 2020, their view is we we just didn't do enough to take the election from the guy who won it. They don't think, you know, next time we should really win by appealing to more voters and getting more people to vote for us. That would be the normal reaction. That would be the pro democracy reaction. Not enough. We didn't convince enough people. Let's be better at convincing people to vote for us. No, they think we can win next time by better working to take the election, even when we don't win it using different techniques or being better with the techniques that we used in 2022, but we just didn't do enough of. So with a midterm 2022 win, they would be far better to carry out that um, uh, upending of democracy in 2024. That's a very dangerous thing. Secondly, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, and others in that uh, cohort have said, if we win in 2022, we're going to investigate Joe Biden. We're going to investigate Hunter Biden, who has nothing to do with the administration. We will end the January 6th committee if it's still going on. We will impeach Joe Biden and on and on and on. They've said that that's what they're going to do. Disaster. And thirdly, they've said if they win, they will quickly work to help the Trump rioters avoid consequences to any extent that they can effectively rewarding the rioters for what they did on January 6th of 2021. Now, in response to this, Nancy Pelosi, who I am not a fan of, Nancy Pelosi recently said, quote, it is absolutely essential for our democracy that we win. I fear for our democracy. If the Republicans were ever to get the gavel, we can't let that happen. And some people are like, oh, she's being hyperbolic. But remember that Canadian political scientist Thomas Homer Dixon, who we interviewed recently, he also wrote and explained to us during the interview that the United States could be under a right wing dictatorship by 2030. And when I asked him, well, what talk to us about the sequence? What are the initial steps and the precursor steps to a right wing dictatorship in 2030 include Trump winning in 2024? And a precursor to that would, of course, be Republicans taking the House in 2022. So the stakes are absolutely huge. And if we just say what's most likely, I'm not saying throw in the towel. I'm not saying don't try. If anything, what I'm saying is we've got to try the more likely outcome, even though Nancy Pelosi won't admit it, is that Republicans take the House in 2022. If nothing significant changes, Republicans only have to flip five seats, remember, to take control of the House in November. That's the most likely outcome that they are able to flip at least five seats. It is a very small margin of error for Democrats. Okay, so we're about halfway through Pacman's comments. I'm going to jump in with some commentary and analysis on what he has said so far. So what I was kind of waiting for there was maybe to hear some acknowledgement of any of the Democrats' blatant failures to do anything about this, the fact that they, as the Republicans have moved right, they have moved right as well, rather than holding the line for left liberalism or something that would be more popular, something that would be some sort of bridge between, you know, the capitalists that control the party and the multiracial working class base that the Democrats try to woo. So far, I've not heard any such acknowledgement at all. Now, maybe it's coming in the second half of the comments. Maybe. I mean, and there was slight acknowledgement that he was not a fan of Pelosi. But so far, it's just, again, Republicans bad. And again, if you're not a Republican, I don't know that you get a huge amount of pushback on that. 
We agree they're bad. I think most people would probably agree the Republicans have gone way too far. And uh, the question, though, is what are we going to do about it? And again, that's where the Democrats come in to just run defense. They really have tried to prevent any kind of substantial change. Uh, if you need to be brushed up on this, go back and listen to the last video, the commentary on the Kyle Kalinske AOC video, because I went into it in great detail there. But anyway, these three points. So the Republicans, or some of the leading Republicans, the far-right reactionaries, see the failure in 2020 as a failure to steal the election. So in other words, uh, they know they lost, but they really consider the fact that they weren't able to scam their way out of the loss as the major problem. Okay, that, that's really concerning. I, too, would like to uh, live in a country without fascism. Of course, this is what capitalism in crisis starts to generate. But okay, yes, I agree. I think that that's a problem. But these people exist now. What is your solution? Just blaming voters for not voting for crap you know, what the Democrats are offering is just lies. Uh, you know, blaming voters for not showing up to basically indict ourselves, to insult our own intelligence, that's not a solution. So what's your solution? Maybe that's coming in the second half. I mean, again, you can't really look at the situation without acknowledging the active role that Democrats have played in preventing any substantial change which could sweep away the Republican Party from coming into being. So point two, the Republicans say that if they get the House, they will investigate Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, and try to impeach Joe Biden. So about this, uh, Pacman merely says, quote, disaster. There's no explanation at all. That's, um, I mean, okay, if they want to investigate Joe Biden, let them investigate Joe Biden. I mean, honestly, this goes back quite a ways to, if anybody remembers Whitewater uh, with Bill Clinton back in the 90s. I mean, this is something that the Republicans do. But again, instead of fighting them, the Democrats have been racing them to the right. So is this a winning strategy? No, it's a strategy for losing any kind of working class interest in your politics. Because the interests of the capitalist class and the interests of the working class are diametrically opposed. Both parties, Democrats and Republican, are owned by the capitalist class. Therefore, fundamentally, both parties fight for the same class interests, but in different styles. The Democrats want a moderate police state. The Republicans want an extreme police state. But yeah, both parties have veered more and more into the terroristic forms of capitalist rule. All right. Point three, help Trump rioters avoid consequences call off the 1-6 investigation, which basically would reward the fascist uprising of 1-6. And, you know, that could uh, embolden more fascists to do even worse things than the January 6th. That may have just been the beginning. Okay, C.1 again. These people exist now. What is your actual solution to this? Because I can tell you from here on the left, as a socialist... I know that capitalism, as it gets deeper and deeper into crisis, which that's what happens over time, uh, it reaches for more and more extreme solutions. So it generates fascism to try to save itself from socialist revolution, first reform and then revolution. You know, capitalists try whatever they can to cling on to power. Okay, I can tell you that my solution as a socialist is to get us out of the system that's creating massive wealth inequality, and uh, all kinds of instability, social, economic, etc., generates sexist, racist, homophobic, transphobic, all kinds of bigoted ideologies in order to scapegoat different groups and create conflict within factions of the working class to basically keep the spotlight off of the capitalist class, which is actually the you know, should be the actual focus point. It's actually the root cause of all these problems is this property system that allows industry to be run privately for profit, exploiting the vast majority of the population. We need to do something about that. And again, does your solution involve any of that? Of course it doesn't. So what I'm telling you is that your solution cannot possibly work 
and please stop acting like it is and stop trying to convince people that it could possibly work because it just simply can't. You're misleading people deliberately, I believe, because this has been going on for decades now and this is where we've wound up and it's a consequence of these kinds of policies. So Pelosi fears the Republicans getting the gavel. What's she doing about it? Complaining. All right. So still waiting on any acknowledgement of Democrats' blatant failures, their active alienation of their base, the constant lies that they put out. Back to Pacman. Now, the other aspect to all of this is, of course, is the Department of Justice going to act at all to show that what took place in 2020 simply cannot happen again and truly hold people accountable? I, uh, you know, I, I have no emotional investment in Merrick Garland one way or the other, but it's increasingly looking like Merrick Garland is sort of spineless. And we're going to talk later. Trump is again asking Putin to help him find dirt on people. This time, Hunter Biden will talk about that a little bit later in the show. But it doesn't seem Merrick Garland wants to do anything. We've got these Manhattan investigators who resigned, including Mark Pomerantz, saying we had good evidence that Trump committed crimes. If we tried some of these cases, we would likely win. But it doesn't seem any charges are coming there and multiple prosecutors have resigned as a result. A federal judge recently said, and we talked about it earlier this week, it's pretty apparent that Donald Trump committed felonies. And yet what? Nothing. The Department of Justice seems to be completely feckless. And you have to understand that this is bigger than just Merrick Garland. In general, number one, the checks and balances that we have are checks and balances, but they never accounted for someone like Trump. They, they just didn't. And we talked about this during the Trump era. Um, and the federal bureaucracy in general has never really held presidents accountable in any serious way. So about 10 different things have to happen, including Democrats earning more votes, the DOJ taking this seriously. And unfortunately, uh, it sort of seems like many Democrats are more willing to allow the possibility of democracy dying than to take the gloves off and saying, hey, you know what? We do have to do some unprecedented things, but that's because we've already had unprecedented circumstances. The Trump presidency was already unprecedented. And when that's the case, you might have to take unprecedented action. Very scary times ahead. And it is not hyperbolic to say that democracy is in peril. As yet another example of this, let's talk about yet another request from Donald Trump to Vladimir Putin. Before we do that and switch into casual mode, I guess, at the Pacman show, let's again pause to digest some of what's been said. So a lot of quotes in here. The other aspect is the Department of Justice is basically being inactive. OK, is Pacman surprised about this? I don't really understand. I mean, by his own admission, he knows that the federal bureaucracy has never held presidents accountable in any serious way. Okay, so is Merrick Garland actually spineless and feckless, or is he just complicit in a system that was basically set up, you know, to administrate and govern and try to expand a basically immoral, corrupt system, which is based on exploitation? Uh, of labor, of resources and nature, of animals and so forth. Like, that's what the system does. And the people who become part of the bureaucracy which govern it, I got to tell you, are not exactly exemplars of, you know, the most advanced morality that humanity has ever been able to devise. But I think that we can dig into this a little bit more with another quote from Pacman. They never accounted for someone like Trump. Wow. So Pacman does not expand on what he means by that. So what does Pacman mean by that? I mean, we kind of have to speculate a little bit. Somebody who just doesn't give a fuck about pretending to care as many other players in this system do. Um, I don't know. He wasn't specific. So basically, Pacman is saying that Trump single-handedly is like breaking the system by just not, you know, playing by its rules and assumptions because the system was just set up 
to rein in like a certain amount of corruption or something within, I mean, obviously the system itself is a sort of corruption and cancer, but it was built to like manage that cancer in particular ways. And I guess he's saying that Trump is just so audacious. Um, you know, he's knocking over the little velvet rope barriers that they have set up and the few ushers that the system is equipped with are just not prepared to deal with somebody so audacious that would not be shamed by such ungentlemanly and, you know, dishonorable actions. Sir, you have disgraced our system. Yeah, whatever. You know, this is the stage of capitalism we're in. And Trump is a representative of it. If the system is not prepared to rein people like that in, then yes, you have to face the destruction of that system at the hands of people like him because the system has entered a sort of death spiral. So this whole thing, you know, quote, Trump was unprecedented. Fucking Bush was unprecedented. Reagan was unprecedented. What have Democrats been doing about any of this? Moving to the right along with them. So, as Pacman says, quote, Democrats are willing to face the possibility of democracy dying. So, again, newsflash to, you know, another pundit in the field. Democracy is already dead. I'm sure you actually know that, but you're still pretending like it isn't. But, yeah, there is no functioning democracy, not really, in the United States already. You have refused to come to terms with that. You're still promoting the illusion that there's something there. For people to hang on to. There hasn't been for a while now. So I guess this raises the question for people like Pacman, is there ever an end? Do they ever stop clinging to the Democratic Party as the system goes further and further down the spiral? I don't know. Does it matter? We, we have to organize around these people. What we're doing, it, it just, it's not going to involve them. It can involve them if they renounce their ways and come and join us and, you know, let go, abandon these uh, strategies that are totally counterproductive and have contributed to the kind of situation that we're in now, but uh, definitely not before that. Anyway, let's go back now to Casual Friday Pacman, Pacman number two, to finish out the comments. One of our sponsors is Blinkist, who's been supporting the David... Oh, so actually that's just a commercial. So... That's all we get out of Pac-Man. Nothing really there, you know, as per usual, I guess, with David Pacman. But uh, I was expecting more. <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, I guess I'll just say the basic point that I think that, if nothing else, everyone in the U.S. left needs to learn. The fundamental task of the U.S. left is to detach completely from the Democratic Party and from all capitalist parties. Essentially, we need to recreate the Bernie moment, the stadium-filling mass movement around issues of reform in the interest of working-class people, to take that as far as we possibly can, inject as much of a militant character into that as possible, take it to the limits of capitalism, and then beyond rallying support for abolishing capitalism entirely. But we're still kind of at that point of needing to coalesce that coalition and what can I say? It's got to happen. I'm calling for it. I'm ready for it. I'm ready to support it when it happens. There's a lot of fakers, bullshitters out there, grifters, you know, but eventually this will happen and we just got to take it as far as we possibly can when it does come. Anyway, that's it from me. What do you think? Leave a question or comment below. We'll continue the discussion there as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, Head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging, and they're also materially helpful. So I really appreciate those, and I've been able to produce a lot more content than I would have been able to do without all of the support. So thanks again to the patrons, as well as to the people who support the channel through non-financial means, including liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting on the videos. All of that helps to boost the channel. In the YouTube algorithm, helps more people to stumble across this content. We're really trying to make this as accessible as possible as it's been suppressed for a long time. And this channel is part of a movement to make the ideas, 
theory, history, commentary related to actual socialism, Marxism, more accessible to the public and easier to just sort of stumble across in people's day-to-day lives. People have questions about capitalism and society in general, and we would like actual socialists to be the ones answering those questions. Thanks again, and we will catch you in the next video.